Good day, and welcome to the Dish Network Corporation Q3 2023 Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Tim Messner, EVP and General Counsel. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're joined on the call today by Charlie Ergen, our Chairman, John Soringa, our President of Technology and COO, Paul Orban, our CFO, Tom Cullen, EVP of Corporate Development, Mike Kelly, EVP and Group President of Retail Wireless, and Gary Shaman, Group President of Video Services. Before we start, I need to remind you of our safe harbors. During this call, we may make forward-looking statements which are subject to risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from historical results or from our forecasts. We assume no responsibility for updating forward-looking statements. For more information on factors that may affect future results, please refer to our SEC filings. We don't have any prepared remarks this morning, so with that, we'll open it up to questions, starting with the analyst community. Thank you. Okay, we will now begin taking questions from the analyst community. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone the opportunity to signal for questions. Our first analyst question comes from Walter Pysik with Lightshed. Please go ahead. Walter, your line is open. Please go ahead. I am not hearing a response. We will move to our next question. And our next question comes from Michael Rollins with Citi. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I was curious if you could talk more about the uh, retail results for wireless in the quarter. And can you frame uh, what's happening on the subscriber side, what's happening in terms of the EBITDA burn, and then break out the boost infinite component of those results? Thanks. Uh, good morning. This is uh, this is Mike Kelly. Um, on the Boost uh, Wireless side, I would say um, this is my first uh, full quarter on the job. Uh, there's a lot of discipline that we brought back into the sales channel over the quarter, which resulted in less net ads than we expected. Uh, we uh, we we put discipline back into to the sales process that I felt was was necessary. Uh, we focused on putting devices in the hands of our customers that uh, will load on the 5G network going forward. Uh, we realigned our dealer compensation for the period uh, with the goal of acquiring profitable customers going forward. And uh, uh, we put back in control that uh, we felt was necessary for profitable customers going forward. Uh, Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about the EBITDA? Yeah, <clears throat> so marketing was a higher for the quarter. Um, as Mike alluded to uh, with the, the change in the commission structure, it was elevated in Q3. You'll see that abate in Q4 as we get fully under the new commission structure. And also, as uh, Mike alluded to, as it relates to equipment COGS, the, that was high for the quarter because we had a higher percent of handsets that had our 5G or that are capable to work on our 5G network deployed. That will help us in future quarters as we'll get owner economics on those phones. And just one follow-up. If you look at the current base of Boost Sub 7.5 million and the revenue that they're generating, is there a path just for that portion of the business to get that to be significantly profitable again, and that can fund the subscriber acquisition for new Boost Infinite opportunities? or is it that the current business is dealing with just a higher recurring cost than maybe we've seen over the last couple of years? Yeah, this is Charlie. Let me, and I'll maybe turn it over to Mike. The, the, I'd say a couple things. One is that, 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 when, when the, that the, the CDMA shutoff that happened, you know, that, was, that was kind of devastating for, for what we expected because we, we had to replace all those customers with new phones. 
so we, we missed the cycle of, had, had that been happening today, we could put them on phones that were compatible with our network, but obviously when that was done um, well, well over a year ago, there were no phones that were compatible with our network. So, so for the most part, those 7.5 million customers, the vast majority of them, do not have phones compatible with our network. So that's an upgrade cycle and that set of economics that, that, we, that, that we'll be able to do a portion of those, but not, not the vast majority, that would be my guess, that, because we missed that cycle. So that's why we fought so hard to, to, to hold uh, T-Mobile to what they had, what they had said, said under penalty of perjury you know, uh, to the California leg- regulators. Um, the, when Mike came in, and he didn't, re- I'll give him a little bit more credit than, than maybe the street's giving him right now, but the, the, the customers that we have, that we were getting customers, we just weren't sure which ones were the good, you know, some customers we made money on and some we didn't. And so um, I think now everybody we're putting on now, um, for the most part, we have high expectation that we'll make money, either because we're on our network or because they're on the MVNO, but they're just a different uh, uh, class of customer. And so some of that's discipline and how you do it. Some of the commission structure that he alluded to, for retailers, they were incentivized to get a customer, but they weren't necessarily incentivized to keep the customer. That, that's changed. They're incentivized to keep the customer today. So, and they have a lot of control over what customers they put on. So those are, those are things that, that it's certainly my fault for not being more on top of that in the earlier years, but Mike has, has come in and made you know, those changes. And so um, that's going to, that's going to, we'll have better performance as a result of that on, on, on both prepaid and postpaid. Thanks. Our next question comes from Walter Pysik with Lightshed. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, just a question, I guess, in general about the postpaid business. Um, I mean, the, the value proposition is obviously very compelling, but it just feels like no one really knows about it. And it's on the Amazon homepage. It's not really there. Just curious, is there a plan for the ad spend to increase? Um, and if so, how much flexibility do you have in terms of that, that spend? And then, I guess, related, CapEx-wise, how much can you cut? Um, I mean, obviously, the CapEx is already starting to come down, but when we head into 2024, 20, uh, how much, how many of the available dollars do you have that can, you can cut out of CapEx so you can actually use it to tell people about the $25 a month service? Well, I would say first on the on the Amazon relationship, I would say uh, we we do have flexibility in terms of how we continue to to evolve and build out the storefront. A lot of things came together on a very short period of time uh, towards the end of the quarter. Uh, we continue to work with Amazon uh, to improve the the overall storefront presentation. Uh, so you'll continue to see that evolve this quarter. And uh, with respect to advertising, uh, we do have a relationship with, with, with Amazon to focus on, on acquiring customers through that channel. So we will be working with their, their advertising sales team as well. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is Paul. I'll take the uh, CapEx question. Um, CapEx, uh, we do expect it to uh, decrease in Q4 and then going into 2024, it'll it decrease also. What you're seeing is it's uh, cash CapEx, so we, you had a timing issue. So most of what was paid in Q3 really related to Q2 deployments. It was more so of a 10,000 foot question, I think. And, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Charlie. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. It was more of a 10,000 foot question, not not like timing of this quarter versus next, but like if you were spending whatever it is, two seven, two five, like can you take that down to a billion for next year, 500 million? Like how low can you go so you have those dollars to kind of use to tell people about the service? Because it seems like the service, again, offering is compelling. It's just like how do people find out about it? Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, if constructive criticism are we doing a great job of marketing the answer is no <laughs> okay can we do can, you know the 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 messaging probably wasn't it you know wasn't didn't have quite the desired effect you know as you say because people don't know about it and let me give you examples uh, if you walk into an uh, Apple store today you can't buy boost right you can buy our competitors but you can't and when you go to their homepage digitally you can't buy boost 
today. You know, we're not even integrated into, into their system because that takes time, it takes an investment on their part. So we're hopeful that, you know, obviously they'll support us there. So we're not hitting on, we're not hitting on all cylinders there. That, that's kind of the, the bad news. The good news is, 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 it, it, is we've made the, for the we, when we make, when we do it right um, online, we make that a, a better experience than going to a store. And that's the strategy that we have to have. We have to make online, uh, whether it be Amazon or other partners, right, that experience be, be better for most people than going to a store and waiting in line and, and so forth. If we do that, we'll be very successful. And there, have, there has to be messaging and marketing and things to make that happen. But having said that, that's the strategy. You know, if you, what's nice about that is, in a funny sort of way, is we, we could hit the ground running a lot faster if we had 5,000 stores and postpaid, but we don't. On the other hand, if you make the online process better, you're going to wish you didn't have 5,000 stores. Talk to the bookstores of the world about that. Right, so we think we're where the puck is going. We think we're in the right place. When we make it with our with, with when it works, it really works, and it's a great experience. There are a ton of issues, um, but some on our side, some on our partner side, that we still have to correct operationally because it, we would have liked to had a few more months to before we had before we went out to the to the public. But the iPhone came out on a certain date. We had to meet that date. Right, or else we would miss the that wave. So we felt like we needed to be there. So we're we're a little ahead of our skis. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, but having and so we're making a few more mistakes than we probably normally would like to make. But we're failing fast and and we're learning. And I think that'll pay off for us. So I think strategically, Walt, we're on the right side. I I think the any any criticism on the marketing side is is well received here, uh, in terms of we know we need to do better there, and we know that the messaging has to be fine-tuned and it's not just the messaging it's the operations it's how you promote it it's a it's a two or three different things in our company with our partners working together to do that uh, we haven't quite cracked that that yet but but we will and how low can you get capex charlie for 24 well i mean i think nothing's changed you know, actually something did change a little bit the the we've said 10 billion dollars on the capex side we're obviously short of that the puerto rico sale i mean but maybe I'll, you, you're more familiar with that than I am, so maybe I'll let you yeah, this, uh, talk about that. That helps a little on the I, CapEx side. Yeah, I don't know that Paul's willing to give guidance on total CapEx for next year, but the, we announced the Puerto Rico sale this morning. We have a lot of experience in Puerto Rico over the years with pay TV and the last couple of years with wireless. It's a challenging market. It's a very competitive market. It uh, has weather challenges as well. The build-out would be expensive, so we, we thought it best to um, enter into a transaction which gives Liberty a much more competitive spectrum position, frees up, um, brings us new capital in terms of the sale proceeds, as well as pretty significant capital savings from not having to build on both the islands, which are very expensive builds and, and higher than average OPEX. So, by entering into the transaction, we'll now be able to focus those funds uh, back into the continental U.S. But I mean, the big okay, picture. Thanks. Walt, I, I I think I understand your question. We have we have several levers, right, that that to manage cash. One of those is marketing and, and just the SAC in terms of acquiring customers. We how, the more profitable customers, the faster you want to go. The, the more marginal a customer is, probably the slower you go, but, you know, it depends on how our total operators are doing. And then CapEx, where we've met our major milestone, it's not that expensive for us to make the next milestone, um, but because it's, you know, we've done the hard, we've done the heavy lifting. Uh, on the other hand, you want to you want to continue to invest in your network because you want your, you want to move people to, to off the MVNO. So you have to balance, we have to balance those levers uh, and, so it's not an easy answer, uh, other than um, you can expect uh, CapEx will, will continue to decline the rest of this year and into 2024 before you'll see a, uh, a, an uptick in, in, in uh, the first half of 25 for a couple quarters uh, as we finish that final build-out milestone. So um, just, just, it will free just up capital. Just one more. One more. It, will yep. it will free up capital. How that gets spent will be dependent on how, we're, how well we're doing in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our business. If you don't mind, I just want to try one more angle on this, which is, you know, I know you've been generally adverse to 
basically giving away phones, right? You know, using working capital, you know, whether it's payment plans or just literally subsidizing phones, like what AT&T does to a certain extent with its existing customers. Um, you know, now that you've had the offer in the market, is it just a recognition of people seeing the $25 and activating a second SIM or whatever it is versus are you starting to think that maybe, you know, being more aggressive with spending capital on basically giving away free phones or at least subsidizing a portion of them is going to be necessary to get some traction going on the postpaid side. Yeah, I mean, it, look, it, we're realists that nobody really subsidizes the phone, right? They, they obviously charge the customer for, for the phone. So we're not opposed to that. I mean, that, that you know, I, but when you have your own, when we have our own owner, own, owner economics, you realize our variable cost for that customer, our variable cost is zero. <laughs> so there's a lot of interesting things we can do as we move into it. I, this question hadn't been asked, but I think I'm just going to transition this because I think it's important at, at, indirectly to this question. So we transition as we transition people to our network, the, the world changes for us economically. And, and John, maybe uh, John is our president chief operating officer and has all the, the build out, the, the, you know, and as he's in the budget cycle pretty heavily now, it would we'll probably get a, maybe you want to jump in here and give a, to, to maybe better answer Walt's question, give a feel for how that how you look at it. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Charlie. And uh, hey, Walt, uh, thanks for the questions today. Uh, so really, I'm working on a three-legged stool. Um, the first piece is um, we've got a little over 120 million uh, commercial Bonner pops today, about a third of the country, um, where we have voice and data, which is needed for Boost Mobile and Boost Infinite. Um, we're going to take that uh, another third up to... Uh, 240 million by June. So you can sort of see our trajectory there uh, in terms of uh, where we get uh, uh, sort of full M&O economics in our retail business. But at the same time, and I've talked about this on earlier calls, um, there's been a lot of focus on getting uh, the device ecosystem where it needs to be to support us. And right now, uh, to, to give you a feel for it, about a third of the devices we activate um, are compatible with our network, uh, 5G SA, our spectrum bands, those sorts of things. Um, and again, up to June next year, we'll move that to two thirds. All right, so that's an that's an another sizable shift um, with the support from the Android community. Um, obviously, you saw the news on the iPhone, um, and so we're working through the device side of it as well. And uh, the net impact of that is, as we bring in new customers, the economics change dramatically. Um, we expect to be able to uh, see that as we head towards next June. Uh, but in addition, the, the other effect, and I think uh, a few of the analysts wrote about this uh, this morning in an earlier reports, we get to take a sizable chunk out of our MVNO bill. Um, so we, as we look at that, uh, we see that going down uh, by a third as we get to June of next year. Um, so those three things together really sort of change our trajectory in the retail business. And uh, I think where you started is the idea that where do we find capital to invest? And those are those are a few areas to look at and model around that. Yeah. So, so the big the the picture is we have scale June of next year. That's you have scale. We're a year behind where we'd like to be for scale, but we'll have scale um, next year both on devices and the network. Um, that network is about where Sprint was, you know, uh, at the end. So it, it that, that now you have scale and 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 your capex is primarily done. Your um, and you're only going to get you're only going to improve from the two thirds that that John's talking about. So that gives you a feel for it. Got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Canon Venkateshwar with Barclays. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Paul. Maybe a couple for you. Um, when we think about the S4 projections that you provided with the Equistar uh, filing. Um, it assumes sequentially a, an increase in losses, a further increase in losses in Q4 in wireless. And you pointed to some tailwinds and costs in Q4. So if you could just help us reconcile, um, you know, the Q4 trends. And then as we look at the same projections for next year, there's a big acceleration in trends um, with respect to, you know, profitability. So if you could just uh, help us understand the underlying assumptions in terms of volumes versus price and what you're assuming to get to those numbers, that would be very helpful. Thanks. 
Well, you know, overall, when you look at the forecast there, there's going to be some puts and takes, and the timing may change, but we believe the forecast that we had in the S4 is still accurate. Uh, we'll continue to deploy in Q4 more towers, and you'll have more OPEX, um, which will be uh, helping to uh, drag down OIBIT in the fourth quarter. And then as we grow, obviously, you're going to have SAC and the costs that are related to growing uh, the Boost Infinite and the Boost Mobile business uh, in Q4 and in Q1. Got it. And then, Charlie, when you think about uh, capital needs for next year uh, and beyond, you obviously have the debt maturities and, you know, uh, the Equistar deal should help address some of it. But if you step back and think about maturities beyond that, there's obviously a big, you know, in, uh, step up in um, in capital required, even as your CapEx needs also potentially go up in 25 and beyond. So if you think about, uh, you know, beyond 24, um how should we think about the capital plan? How much of it is internally funded? How much of it is externally funded? Then, you know, if you could just help us understand what your partnership options are or update us on that, that would be very helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the way, you know, obviously 2026 is a, is a, <laughs> is a, is a pretty big wall, to, uh, you know, in terms of in t assuming you didn't refinance anything, right? And obviously, it, uh, a lot depends on where the markets are, right? So what we, we, we want to control is what we control. From an operations point of view, we've got to generate as much internal cash from our operations as we can. Um, and, you know, I, the way I would say it is we have a, a narrow, we have a narrow path, but there is a path for us to, to achieve um, uh, financial stability and, and make sure we meet our commitments. And so, um, you know, having been through this for a long time, we've had narrow paths before, and, and it, you know, it's a sharp focus for your management, and it, it you know, necessity sometimes of other inventions. So, um, you know, that we, we certainly look at 2026 as a challenge today. Um, we uh, expect that the market environment will be better in 2026, but there's no guarantee of that, obviously. Um, you know, if the market environment today was like it was the same in 2026, I think that would, be, would, would prove to be difficult for us. But um, based on our operations today, on the other hand, if your operations continue to continue to improve and you, you, you show the market the trends and the and the financial trends based on having your own network and owner economics, um, and you continue to to cash flow in your core businesses, um, then that's an achievable place to get to. Um, and so. You know, I, my crystal ball is 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 it believes that we can do that, right? And but I know it's going to be a challenge for us, and and we have a team that's going to be up to that. Got it. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from John Hudlick with UBS. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, maybe just a couple of follow-ups to, to Walt's question. First of all, can uh, Charlie? Can you guys talk about any? traction you're seeing with the iPhone 15 promotion and, um, and and when you are winning customers on the on the Boost Infinite side, wh where are they coming from? And then just lastly, uh, clarification, what what drives the, the uptake in, in, in uh, compatible phones to two-thirds? Is it just the availability of, of new phones that, that, that work on your network or I'm just wondering why sort of June is, is, the, is it sort of magic from getting to that two-thirds now? Thanks. Well, this is Mike. Um, thanks for the question, John. Um, yeah, we're seeing some traction on the on the iPhone 15. Uh, no surprise, uh, customers are attracted to the $60 offer and to the um, iPhone upgrade every year offer. We're still working through, as, as Charlie mentioned earlier, this is uh, we're a, a, a digitally native um, selling direct process. So it, it's new to us. We're still working through some of the operational kinks. But uh, we're making progress there. Um, so, um, so I think uh, so. Again, demand is, is is coming from the other carriers, and uh, certainly we're seeing some demand coming from the um, the relationship that we have with Amazon and marketing into into the Amazon base. And then, uh, uh, thanks, John, for the follow up question on the devices. Uh, this is uh, John Swearinger. So. Uh, it, it, let me try to simplify uh, the earlier response. I mean, essentially, in 2024, we'll have 100% support uh, on Android. 
terms of every Android device that we distribute uh, will be compatible with our network. Uh, on the Apple side, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. Uh, newer models uh, have our bands and can support uh, 5G SA software with iOS 17 and above. And so really it's about getting to that point where um, we've got full Android support, partial Apple, and then we obviously there's still a profitable BYOD business um, where we'll, we'll bring existing devices onto our network, and in some cases that may be on the MVNO. Uh, but that's sort of how the forecasts roll forward, and it's really been a device-by-device, chipset-by-chipset uh, approach for us to get to the critical mass. hope that helps. Yeah, and on the Apple side, yep. just, just to make sure you don't misunderstand, the 15 is fully compatible, but the 12 and the 13 and the 14, which we still sell, actually the 11, mm -hmm. right, are not compatible. So obviously we would, you, you know, that's, those can only go on, at this point on MVNO, uh, absent some software downgrades or so forth and so on, but the the 100% um, of new apples are are, but we but that's not 100% of our business with Apple. Got it. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Jonathan Chaplin with New Street. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, guys. Two quick ones, if I may. First of all, I saw so what looked like some new. Uh, capital going into Connect. I'm wondering if there's still an opportunity to combine Boost with Connect and help accelerate the um, the sort of the flywheel at Boost um, with new outside capital. Um, and then I'm wondering, Charlie, if you can give us a, an update on where discussions might stand with TPG and at and um, on on DBS now that you've got the Echo Star transaction squared away. Um, I'm wondering if there's a path to progress on on the next big deal. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take both those. The, the, on, first, on on the, the, the TPG question, that that we're we're focused on on we're still getting the Echo Star dish transaction done. I mean, obviously we filed a lot of stuff, but we we got a ton of stuff in terms of combining the companies and the management teams and 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 making sure that we don't wait on synergies and 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 get those. Um, and with Hamid starting next week, that that will be very helpful. So we just don't have any plans for DirecTV uh, based on that. Um, the um, connects um, is not probably appropriate to to comment on uh, here. So, but what I would say is that I think within within our capital structure, obviously a a uh, uh, a retail wireless company that has seven and a half million subscribers and now has an online presence is is probably a valuable company. Um, um, we could we could argue whether we've managed it as well as we should, but the the, act, the fact is that the that, that that's a very valuable property. So um, obviously there could be um, ways that, that 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 there may be that from an investment point of view there may be people that are interested in that sort of thing. Uh, but it's also the same way with our network uh, as well. Um, it's, it's, there's only four companies in the United States that have a nationwide network and connectivity. There's only one of those companies that actually does it in a 21st century architecture um, where it is a data-centric network built 100% for data, of which voice is just an application. And in the world of uh, things like AI, where data is only valuable to you if you can utilize it, then you want IT, you want IT architecture, you want IT tools like cloud and Kubernetes and so forth and so on, uh, and that's what we've built, and that that is a one of a kind thing, and I think that 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 that's where ultimately the 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 game will be won and lost for us, which is to is to make sure that we're not spending all our resources trying to do exactly the same thing that everybody else has done, and that we actually go where we have unique capabilities um, that that we can do for pe folks and customers that others can't. And so um, I'm, I'm excited about Hamid joining next week because that frees me up to do a little bit of that, uh, which is which we, where can we take this thing where we have unique um, advantages, um, but perhaps you know, maybe even our competition doesn't doesn't want to go, or it's not economical for them to go, um, and and so forth. So um, 
you know, I don't know that I answered your question exactly, Jonathan, but that, that's the color. Thanks, Charlie. Our next question comes from David Barton with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for uh, taking the questions. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, but Charlie, could you explain your thought process on the T-Mobile 800 megahertz option? Um, you know, spending $100 million up front, obviously you were going to have to spend 70 something if you didn't buy it anyway, but um, you know, your bonds are yielding 25%. Um, you're going to get $1.9 billion-ish from the Echo Start deal when it closes, but you said in your filings that that's not going to be enough to, to do that deal. So how does that deal happen? And I know you love to use the word options and optionality, but I think now might be a great time <clears throat> to be specific and, and crystal clear about how you see that happening. And then in a related question, You've got $3 billion in debt coming due in 24. Um, about, a, you know, about nine months ago, you maybe said that your intention was to take the convert that's coming due in March and, and use equity to, to refinance that. Is that still the plan? Um, and and how, do you, how do you deal with, with the $2 billion coming due at, at the end of 24? That would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, certainly we're focused on the, on the convert coming up in, in, in March. Um, Equity obviously is more difficult because obviously the marketplace is, is, has been more negative for us uh, over the last year on that piece. But we certainly we certainly haven't given up that equity could be a component part of that. Um, the uh, 800 megahertz is 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 I probably can't give you a complete answer. Uh, uh, first of all, we did owe, we owed 72 million dollars regardless, and we're thankful that. We were able to work out with Department of Justice and T-Mobile to, to give us more time to to put something together there. I mean, obviously, the the um, uh, we think there's some unique capabilities about that. We have built it out at Dish, so um, we're already have you know we're already heavily invested, probably more than a billion dollars in investing that out. And so, in addition to the hundred million, you know, we've obviously invested in that. Now you. You aren't going to go. You're not going to fall for a sunk cost fallacy, obviously. But economically, we think that 800 has some unique uh, characteristics, and we think that there's uh, use cases for it outside of the uh, of of everything that we're doing. And and you know, the way I would say it is, to the extent that we have a good business plan for that uh, uh, resource, that 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 may be financeable. To the extent we don't, it certainly is not financeable. And it's possible, even with a good financing, a good business plan, given the marketplace today, that it's not financeable. Uh, but um, you know, that's certainly going to be a focus uh, for me for the next six months, and, and we'll see where we end up there. But we don't have. Um, um, obviously, we think that I, I think this quarter we reduced the odds that we we're going to be successful there. We're realist about it. The marketplace hasn't improved since last quarter, so. Um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll wait and see, but it's a it's a unique resource. Uh, it's it's important to what we're trying to do uh, to compete, uh, and therefore we're gonna we're gonna give it our best shot. Appreciate the comments, Charlie. Thank you. As a reminder, if anyone from the analyst community would like to ask a question at this time, please press star one. Our next question comes from Ben Swinburne with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, guys. A couple of questions. Um, on the retail wireless gross margins, service gross margins, and we've been expecting to see those get better over the course of time. And you guys signed a, I know you guys signed two M, new MVNOs last year into this year. You were sort of double paying on back office stuff. I think that's ended. Why why are we not seeing better unit economics in the retail wireless business on the service side um, as we move through the year? Um, and what should we expect going forward? And then second, you know, Charlie, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but when you look at the value that the market is ascribing to the company, um, especially the market value, the equity and the debt, compare it to the sum of the parts value of what you've bought in Spectrum and Etc. There's a massive gap there. Um, is there anything that, that you were looking at that would lead you to change your strategy 
significantly. And especially in the context of just a higher interest rate environment where you might look to unlock value differently through asset sales, spectrum sales, et cetera, than the path you're on. Thank you. I'll take, I'll, I'll take the second question and then maybe... One yeah, I'll, I'll take the first. This is Mike. Um, uh, ben, I'll take the first part of this. Uh, we've been focused on, um, on, get, on, on obtaining better customers, and so uh, we've been putting better devices in the hands of our customers, those that will uh, transfer over to the, to the M&O uh, as we build out. We've also been focused on uh, aligning our dealer commissions with the long-term profitable uh, needs of the company. So the dealer commissions had some, some impact on margins for the quarter. Uh, that'll change over time. Uh, I don't know, Paul, if you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just add to that. You, you'll see a material decrease in the cost of services related to the commissions in Q4. Uh, Q3 um, had uh, you know, more cost in it as we transition to the new commission structure, and Q4 will be 100% on that new commission structure. I think the, the broader question is, where do you expect margins to go? Or, you know, that they will improve. Okay. Um, and then on the uh, uh, on this, but look on strategy. Uh, my, way, my philosophy is I look at it every day, right? The, the world events, the uh, competition does something, opportunity that you didn't know existed happens. So you're looking at your strategy every day, and you're and you're looking at that as related to what your strategy is, and say, is there anything we should change? Um, and so, um, um, we're not, a, we're not, we believe we're on the right strategy. Um, maybe we haven't articulated it, uh, as well as many companies do in part because I think we play our cards a little bit closer to our best maybe. Uh, but, um, uh, we think we're on the right strategy, but we evaluate it. Amid, Amid's very good at strategy himself and, and he, he may have some different ideas that he'll challenge us on. Um, but. Um, I, the only thing I can say is, to your point, with, us, with the assets that we have and the position that we're in, other than the financial side of the markets, right, which is obviously a great challenge for us, we're pretty well positioned for the 21st century. I mean, there's, the, everything's got to be connected. Wireless is the only way you can do it on a mass basis. Um, or you, Certainly wire can do it a lot, but not everywhere. Um, and we have a unique... Our, we, have a, we have a very modern system with the unique set of resources. So um, good management will be able to will be able to take that and and, and operate that. And uh, you know that's what we that's what, uh, you know certainly what we're focused on. And we have maybe not been as good as we'd like to be, but um, you know we we think we've got the right team in place to do it. Okay. And, and if I could just ask a follow up on a different topic, Charlie. The pay TV business is obviously important for you guys from a cash flow point of view, um, and you've been managing it that way for a long time. The, the Disney charter uh, dispute this year or this quarter or this past quarter seemed to highlight you know, some pretty big changes in that business. And I'm wondering if, if that has informed or highlighted or brought your attention to sort of opportunities to sort of either drop channels or run that business in a way that's maybe more aggressive. You don't have a broadband business or in a different place in Charter, but you've also been arguably early on sort of pairing off networks that don't work anymore economically. I'm wondering if, if you took anything from that situation as you guys look ahead on pay TV. Thanks. Uh, so this is Gary. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, look, overall, hey, we're always looking at our relationships. We're always looking at our relationships to see where we can partner strategically and where we can be innovative with partners and help to improve the experience that, that's available to customers. And yes, we're also looking at you know, where are our costs best spent and how we allocate capital efficiently. And so that, that's an ongoing thing we're looking at. It is important that we provide a good service to our subscribers to drive cash into business and to make sure that they love us and they want to stay with us. But yes, we're always looking at opportunities to be more efficient. And we were... Um, we were generally aligned with, I think, the positioning that Charter took in terms of understanding that, that certain parts of the, of the model is broken. And this company has done, you know, taken those um, steps in the past, especially if you look at our history of RSNs. So we'll continue to look, look at opportunistic uh, ways to, to optimize our customer experience and our allocation of capital. Thanks so much. 
We will now take our final question from the analyst community. Members of the media on the call, please press star 1 now to enter the queue to ask a question. We will begin the media portion of this call following the answer to the final analyst question. Our final analyst question comes from Brian Kraft with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Um, hi, good morning. Um, thank you for taking the question. Uh, can you talk about the expense outlook for the 5G business? I think there was a pretty sizable step up in cost of sales uh, this quarter, and I'm just trying to understand if we should think about that as a good run rate um, going forward, or if there was anything that was you know, maybe temporarily elevating it, or, or if it could even go the other way and might further step up in 4Q. And um, also, should we expect to see more revenue coming in on the 5G network, uh, 5G network co side, or will you really be focusing the growth investments on retail postpaid? And then just lastly, also on expenses in pay TV, um, you know, they didn't really come down this quarter, um, and, you know, obviously they, they need to keep pace with the revenue declines as much as possible. Are, are you planning to manage these costs down more aggressively, you know, let's say over the next couple of quarters? Thank you. Hi, this is Paul here. I'll take the uh, 5G uh, expense question. Um, that, that grew due to the fact that we placed more towers and service, so you have the OPEX that's related to that. As we continue to place more towers and service in Q4, as well as the first part of next year, you'll see that number grow. Um, we are optimistic that we'll be able to, at some point uh, in the near future, start to uh, monetize that network on top of um, subscribers and get revenue generation um, from a commercial perspective. And um, this is Gary on the video side. Um, look, in terms of our sales and support costs, you know, it's a mature business, and we're always looking to manage our costs to match our subscriber and sales trends. And so we're, we're, we'll regularly adjust how we um, you know, allocate our resources to align with what we see in the market. And that's kind of what we'd like to say about that. Yeah, and just, just by point of reference, and structurally, Gary had slang, but now he has slang. And now he has all the pay TV, so structurally, um, you, 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 what you have pointed out is a is a is a correct uh, a point of view, which is we haven't managed costs down as well. As, and part of it was structure uh, in the company. Now Gary's got got both sides of the fence there, and I'll pay to. And it's a little bit easier to work to to to, to right size uh, and to the right to people with on the right projects but without having to duplicate it, which is what we had what we had to do. And the other part of it is that. You know, as we as we combine with with Echo Star, there's some other opportunities for us um, uh, within the organization as well. Where we've got talented people on both sides, and um, and 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 some synergy uh, on the cost side. <clears throat> if I could ask just uh, thank you one follow up. Um, can you can you talk about you know just what the pipeline looks like at this point on the 5G enterprise side in terms of you know private network um, RFPs and you know whether there's a lot of activity there. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say it this way: there's a lot of activity, and and you know I think there's two two uh, challenges for us. One is is one is the actual uh, the structure and, and personnel. Uh, we really haven't uh, found the 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 replacement to Stephen By, who's now on our board, but was was obviously on the enterprise side. So we've got a, a little bit a younger team um, that's working it. The second thing is the integration uh, with EchoStar, which which has a more mature enterprise organization um, and has already uh, um, enterprise customers at a much much higher level than we do. Um, I think I saw something last week where, where they just didn't, that, you know, as an example, uh, with an airline, they just did a, uh, a long-term deal with an airline. Well, why is that interesting? Well, airline that's a satellite deal with, for broadband with airlines, but airlines are, are, are companies that will, they, whether it's with us or somebody else, will have private networks because they move cargo, they move people, they, they, move, they need tremendous connectivity at airports and their hangars. Uh, they need connectivity when, when planes are circling. And when they're on the ground, and they need, and and, and so they're all going to have private networks. Well, that's an that's an interesting play because Echo Star is already dealing with with some major airlines, as an example. So, um, I think I think you're going to see uh, real progress there. Um, I don't I don't think you'll see progress next quarter per se. I think you'll see it in 2024, and you'll see it because of the the integration of, of our teams, and that's probably one where the the uh, where uh, uh, 
uh, that you're going to see the, the that kind of jump starts that business for us. Um, for, for, you know, and, and, and I know EchoStar has a pretty big backlog as an example of, of enterprise customer business already. And this is just, I, I think my discussions with the EchoStar folks on the enterprise side is they're excited because they get, they get something else to sell. And I, in fact, for the most part, every, well, some of the enterprise customers are international, but all the domestic customers are, are certainly people that, that I'm sure we, we are in discussion or will have discussions. Thank you. We will now take questions from members of the media. Again, if you are a member of the media and would like to ask a question, please press star 1 now to enter the queue to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone the opportunity to signal for questions. Our first media question comes from Todd Shields with Bloomberg News. Um, hi, thanks. Hi, thanks for taking the qu hi, thanks for taking the question. Uh, Charlie, you said we just don't have any plans for direct TV. Is that forever or just based on right now while you're busy absorbing um, Echo Star? Thank you. Well, that's certainly for now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. But you know our focus is elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from John Celentano with Inside Towers. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, infrastructure question. Uh, last figure I, I heard or saw about the number of cell sites deployed is around 16,000. I, I know you've progressed since then, but w w to reach the 75% of PEAs nationwide, what do you think you're going to need in terms of cell sites? So this is John. Uh, hi, thanks for the question. Um, so look, top level, we're, we're focused on the 73% uh, Bonner footprint, which is most major cities, most NFL markets. Um, we'll have about 20,000 sites on air by the end of this year uh, for macro coverage. Mm -hmm. And we're in the process now of doing all the RF designs and plans uh, for the 2025 build out. It's a slightly different kind of build. Um, in terms of the rurality and other and other factors, uh, but we're probably not in a position to give any more guidance on that right now. But we're we're hard at work to put those plans together. Yeah, great, thanks a lot. Yep. Our next question comes from Jimmy Schaefer with the Carmel Group. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, You've highlighted the 21st century quality of your new network architecture. Do you have any data or material analysis that begins to prove that out? In other words, how much better than current cell service will DISH Wireless be? Yeah, this is Charlie. Jimmy, um, it's, it, I'd say it this way. The, the, from a consumer point of view, the, the, the incumbents do a great job. Their networks work ex extremely well, uh, and and I don't expect that we're going to see, while Vonner voice is, is on the margin a little better, it's not something that's, that that would make you rush out and say, I have to have Vonner voice over, you know, 4G voice or whatever. So uh, I don't think there's going to be a huge difference in, in, in the short term. I think the, it, it's a little bit, from the consumer point of view, it's a little bit how the architecture of everything goes together, including OSS, BSS, and how we might be able to change uh, the, the customer experience long term. Um, it's no different, and you live through this, Jimmy, when we, when we uh, launched DB, uh, digital uh, DBS along with DirecTV, it, the, 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 the ESPN was ESPN. It wasn't really that much different when it started, but we made that you know, when it came to digitizing an interactive guide and making commercials less obtrusive and other things, parental lockout and things like that, we actually made the experience better. We'll have to do the same thing here, but I think in the short term, there's not a big difference to differentiate our network for the consumer. That's much different uh, uh, when it comes to the enterprise business where uh, the enterprise business is about controlling your data making sure you get your data so you can improve your product, make it safer, make it cheaper, make it more innovative, gain market share of the competition, 
make sure that you're uh, uh, um, taking it, that you're reducing climate change and sensors and all the kind of things that you might need uh, where you have control over your data. And, and that's very difficult to do uh, with incumbent networks. And so that's why I, I'll, I, that's why I'm bullish on that side of our business because I think we have strategic advantages, and that's why I'm excited about bringing the Echo Star team or working with the Echo Star team, who's already uh, down that path with satellite. And now we're just going to now we're going to add one more tool to that. So uh, I'm not saying we won't have differentiation for the consumers. I think we will in a number of in a number of ways, but realistically, you know. Um, you're not going to see too much difference. Now, on the network side, realize our, op our OPEX and CAPEX and actual cost of constructing network is much less. So we're getting a lot more bang for, for our money, which ultimately, you know, can lead to, to lower costs for consumers. And Charlie, one more quick question. Do you see anything on the fixed wireless access side that entices you or interests you right now? Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of stuff that I think is interesting. Um, the, you know, the obviously uh, we were we've been disappointed that the FCC hasn't ruled on our on our 12 gig fixed wireless. You know, they they ruled for 12 gig for satellite in a matter of months, and we've been at it for five years on the on the terrestrial side. The only interference from it is with ourselves, right? It, is to DBS. So. It, it, and, and, and so we've said we're not obviously going to interfere with ourselves. So, you know, we're hopeful that, that that's a place that fixed wireless can go. Um, the other, the other, the, the other part of it that I, that I don't, that I'm, a, the reason I'm a little cautious is the government's going to spend, you know, somewhere between 40 and 100 billion dollars on broadband, and they set rules, and it's even state by state now. And the economics of fixed wireless now are being decided by government agencies. And so, if it, if, it's, if everything was 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 fair and a level playing field and the best technology won, I would be unbelievably bullish on fixed wireless. The problem is, if somebody is getting a subsidy, let's say for fiber to to run it 10 miles out to a farmhouse for $100,000, and the government's going to pay for that. Um, you're not going to compete with that with your, even though it's only $1,000 on fixed wireless, you're not going to compete with that $100,000 bill because you have to pay the $1,000 as a private company and, and the government pays the $100,000 subsidy. So um, until we see that sorted out on government policy, it's going to be a little bit tricky on the fixed wireless side. And so Charlie, that, that gives me Charlie. Charlie, do you see any companies out there that are uh, massively improving the capabilities of fixed wireless so that it would get around some of that eventually? Again, um, <laughs> all I can say is the, the, the government is going to pick winners and losers in that, and they're going to pick winners and losers in technology, and some companies are going to do a great job with, with some pump companies – as we know, as we know from past government subsidies, we, we know that some companies will do a great job, and that money be, will be well spent. And, and and you know, electricity was one of those things long term. You know that happened. The, the interstate highway system was one of those things. But we've also seen a lot of times where that money's wasted. Um, you know, where perhaps fixed wire, you know, broadband goes where there already is broadband. And you know, maybe we haven't added new customers to that. And so there'll be some money that'll be wasted there. And and we'll just have to kind of see where you know see where that goes. But it it's hard it's it's hard for our board to look at a, a return on investment on fixed wireless when we don't know if we're competing against the government subsidy or if we're competing against the marketplace. And we're, where we compete against the marketplace, we're very bullish. Great, thank thanks, you, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah. Operator, I, I understand that was the last question from the media. So thank you everyone for joining, and we'll talk to you again next quarter. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.